We're in the book of Revelation, chapter 21. We're going to start at verse 1. You know, every time, whenever I teach from Revelation and I say we're in Revelation, people, people go, ooh, ooh. <laughs> Why is that? It's a, it's a great book. It's a great book. Once you're in Revelation, chapter 20, if you don't know where Revelation is, just go all the way to the end of your Bible, <laughs> and it is the last book. It's the last book in the Bible. Revelation chapter 21, we are literally at the end. And then once you're there, stand up. Stand if you can. Happy New Year's Day. Glad you guys are here, wrapping up the new year with worship and praise and gratitude and studying the scriptures together. The Bible says, beginning in verse 1, uh, and listen, make no mistake about this, you guys know... um, It's all full disclosure. I really want to encourage you to underline, highlight, memorize, anchor yourself to these verses, not just as we close this year, but as we begin the new year. And I'll explain that in a moment. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven. Yeah, that's right. The first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. Surfers always struggle with that one. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is, what is it? It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son." But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Let's pray together. Father, these words are so uplifting and so encouraging. They're inspiring and strengthening, and they're also sobering. God, we pray that we would be a church that is spiritually awake, spiritually alive, God, that we would be a people, that we would be persons, sons and daughters of the Most High God who have surrendered everything to their master, their savior, to Jesus. We pray that you would anchor our hearts, God, anchor our hearts to your story, Father, to what you are doing. And God, may these few moments in your scriptures this morning, may they bring transformation and renewal encouragement and hope, conviction and repentance, God. May they, may they prepare us for what you have, for what you have coming in 2024. In Jesus' name, amen. You can have a seat today. Everyone, everyone is living by a story or by a narrative. Um, Whether they realize it or not, the reality is there is a story or a narrative that we have shaped our life to. It, It provides the framework for our life. Some popular ones in our culture are things like hard work equals success, or the pursuit of true love, or the American dream, or the idea that money equals happiness. 
like all of these stories, you know, and sometimes it's the, it's the family that we, it's, it's, it's not just the culture that we live in or the society or the generation that we're a part of. Sometimes these things are developed within our family network, whatever it may be. Whatever story or narrative you are shaping your life around, truly these things drive your values and your values drive your goals and your goals drive your decisions or your choices. That is how it works for every single human being. Many of us have chosen a story that's been handed down to us by a family member or by our culture um, or by our generation. I want to suggest to you today, and this isn't new news for those of you who um, are part of this church. I've been talking about this for a number of months now. But there is a bigger story that God is writing. There's a bigger narrative that God is writing. And you're a part of that story or narrative whether you realize it or not. Now today you might be thinking, well, what is God's story? What is this overarching and Theologians, uh, commentators, um, people in Christian academia would call it a a meta-narrative. It's the big story that overarches every single story, every event, and all of history in not just our society, but all societies across the course of time. You might be thinking, well, what is that big story? And the big story is this. From curse to new creation, God is redeeming humanity. From curse to new creation. And for those of you who um, are students of the scripture, like immediately the, the bells are going off right now. You're, you're thinking about the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 and chapter 3. And then you're, you're, you're moving all the way through scripture into Revelation chapter 21 and chapter 22 because that phrase, from curse to new creation, is, is a way that we encapsulate in short terms the story of God or the meta narrative of God, the purpose of God, the plan of God, the good work of God in every moment of human history from the inception of time to ultimately its culmination. You might be thinking today, like, well, well, what's the big deal? And why do I need to think in those terms? And and why can't I just focus on my own story and, and, you know, my own values and my own goals and the decisions that I make? Um, and, And my answer to that is, you, as a follower of Jesus Christ, And for those of you who aren't followers of Jesus Christ, this is as important for you. You need to know where this whole thing is going, where this whole thing is going. You need to be able to remind yourself because there's no doubt about it. As we look back at 2023, while we are so grateful for the faithfulness of God, and this definitely is one thing that I see in my life, Rachel and I, as we reflect on 2023, um, gratitude and contentment are the two words that really emerge for us. And just a thankfulness to God for his faithfulness to carry us through every single event that came our way. Many of them a surprise to us, none of them a surprise to God. And it is so important I can just tell you from from personal experience, it is so important for you to be able to anchor yourself to the story of God, to be able to be in a place where you recognize that every single human event in all of history is connected to God's story. This was something that Daniel learned. You remember Daniel when he was with the Israelites in exile in Babylon. There was a very wicked king, his name was Nebuchadnezzar, and he had a dream, and in his dream there was this image, and it was made out of gold and silver and bronze and clay and iron, and no one was able to interpret that dream, and, and Daniel leaned into God. Daniel and Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, they leaned into God because only God had the answer. Only God could bring the revelation, and what Daniel learned um, as God gave him that revelation And Daniel, again, chapters later, years later, would have another vision um, that was connected to this. He would learn that over the course of time, there would be four empires that would rise. 
There would be the Babylonian Empire, there would be the Medo-Persian Empire, there would be the Greek Empire, and then there would be the Roman Empire. And all of those empires and all of the history that was connected to those empires was ultimately connected, and you know this if you've studied the book of, of, of Daniel, all of that was connected to the overall arching purpose and plan, the mission of God. Daniel, this is what I'm saying to you today, Daniel learned to see all world events through the lens of God's story. And that, for Daniel to be able to do that, that required revelation. It required him leaning into God and seeing things not from his own perspective, his own finite perspective, but seeing things from God's perspective. And that was true for Daniel. Let me just say to you today, it is true for you as well. This is your task as a Christian, to know the revelation of God. You say, well, what is the revelation of God? Does it come in dreams and visions? And yes, sometimes it does, but ultimately it comes through his word. This is the revelation of God. And your task is to be able to, in this life, listen to me, see with the end in mind. Your task in this life is to be able to, in the moment that you're living in, to be able to see the events that are unfolding with the end in mind. And the only way that you can see with the end in mind is for you to know what the Bible says. Like we just, we, we read the end of the book. Some of you, some of you are like, um, when you read novels, you're the type of person that you just can't wait. You're so radically impatient. You go all the way to the end, to the last chapter, and you read how the story plays out because, you know, you just, you just can't wait. You don't like to go through the process of discovery. And the great thing about the Bible is this. God tells you how it all wraps up. Like God, God is very explicit and particular about where everything is going. And you have to, listen to me, you have to be able to see current events with the end in mind through the lens of Scripture because if you don't, if you don't, you will live in spin cycle, right? 2024, I don't mean to be discouraging to you today, um, but, but sometimes the, the pastor, I mean all the time, the pastor's got to be the voice of reality. I, I don't predict less chaos in 2024. I pre predict a, more chaos in 2024. 2023 was a wild year. You know, every year seem, we seem to be saying things like, oh my gosh, it's an unprecedented year and these are unprecedented events. And it's like, well, how long can you say that until it's like we all realize that things are moving in a trajectory, you know, where, where more and more chaos is ensuing. And you might say today, well, that's kind of a, that's a depressing outlook on the future. I would say to you, no, that's a biblical outlook. That's a biblical outlook. The Bible doesn't predict for you and for me and for the world that, hey, things are going to get better and day by day, you know, humanity's going to, we're all going to hold hands together. And for those of you who are old, you know what I'm talking about. Sing the Coca-Cola song and, 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 and share a Coke and, you know, governments will be united and economies will be strong and people will love each other and the, the love of many will, will grow strong instead of wax cold. I just got to say to you as a voice of reality, that is not the trajectory of the future until Jesus comes back. I mean, once Jesus comes back, then certainly that will be the case. I think that the coming year is going to have added chaos to it. And if you don't tether yourself to the story of God, not only will the world around you be on spin cycle, but you will be on spin cycle. You'll get caught up in all of it. Now, you might be thinking, because for some of you, maybe that's you look over the course of the last handful of years and you think, man, I got sucked into so many things and I got so wound up, you know, and so disconnected and untethered from God. How do, Pastor, how do I keep myself in a place where while the world is spinning around me, I don't mean to sound like a soap opera this morning, but while the world is spinning around me, I am not spinning with it. Um, and one thing I would say is this, you need to have your heart prepared for the coming of the Lord. We, in December, that's true, I'm excited for his coming. 
Um, we, in December, we're talking about the advent of, of Christ. And of course, by now you know, and I say it, I'll say it again, you're probably tired of us saying it, but ad, advent means arrival or coming. And so, of course, in December, we're really reflecting on and considering in a deeper way the first advent, the first arrival, the first coming of Messiah. Um, and allowing that to really penetrate our hearts and influence us as followers of Jesus Christ. I think it's just so appropriate for us as we've spent a number of weeks considering the first advent to be reminded of the second advent, the second coming. Just as the Jewish people, we laid this out like ad infinitum to you, just as the Jewish people were longing for the coming of their Messiah, so also Christians Christians today should be longing for the coming of their Messiah. We, 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 we know he came a first time, but we also know based on what the scripture says that he is coming again. The second coming of Christ will be in power, it will be in glory, it will be a permanent coming. He is coming with his saints in the second coming. Now, for those of us who are students of scripture, we also know that before the second coming of Jesus Christ, there is going to be a secret coming of Christ, not with his people, but for his people. This is called the rapture. There are a variety of, oh yeah. I'll pause for that, I'll pause for that. This is great, you guys are on one today, which makes it a lot easier for me. So there are, there are a variety of different opinions on um, the rapture. And so this secret coming of the Lord will be in the air and in a twinkling of an eye, in a moment, those followers of Christ living in that generation will escape physical death and will be translated immediately into their glorified body, they will be in the presence of the Lord. There are a variety of scriptures that lay that out for us. <clears throat> some people say, some people say that this um, rapture, this seizing away of this particular generation of believers happens before what we call the tribulation period, which is the last week of Daniel's 490 years, Daniel chapter nine, a seven year period um, where God is fulfilling his covenant promises with the nation of Israel. Some people say the rapture, that coming of Christ, that secret coming as it were to, to snatch away his people comes before that seven year period. Some people say it comes in the middle of that seven year period or, or before the last three and a half years of the fullness of God's wrath. And then some people say it comes after the seven year tribulation period, simultaneous as it were, um, with the second advent of Jesus. Just so you understand, my personal conviction on this is that the church is going to be raptured away, seized away, that generation of believers that will not experience death will be taken to be with the Lord before the tribulation period occurs. That's, that's my view. <clears throat> In any case, listen to me, in any case, every Bible-believing Christian believes in the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Wherever you fall in the spectrum, every Bible-believing Christian believes in the imminent return of Jesus Christ. For, for us, for those of us who believe in a pre-tribulational rapture or a pre-wrath rapture, imminent means at any moment. It means it could happen at any moment. It means that potentially before uh, we get through the service today, this generation is gonna be raptured up to be in the presence of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> even if, even if that's not your conviction, even if you would say, well, I believe in a post-tribulational rapture, the truth is this, you still live with an imminent belief in the return of Jesus Christ, while you may not say that it is at any moment, you do believe it is near. It is near. And in fact, that you ought to be living with an anticipation of the return of the Lord. You know, uh, we're talking about the last days today, and sometimes, I can't go too deep into this because we just don't have the time this morning, but I would say to you, we're not just in the last days, we're in the last seconds. 
we're in the fourth quarter. We're in the final round. For those of you who are Jeopardy fans, we're in final Jeopardy. Like it's, <clears throat> it's happening, right? And not only that, but the early church lived with an expectation of Christ's return in their lifetime. The early church did. You, you might be thinking today, why does this matter? And John lays it out for us why this matters. He says in his first epistle in chapter 3, he said, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. He's talking about the parousia. He's talking about the appearance. He's talking about the soon coming of Christ. This, the, I mean, if you're a post-tribulationalist, second advent, for us, it is the rapture. And this is why it matters. Everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So one of the one of the strong benefits of living with in anticipation of Christ coming in any moment is it keeps our hearts pure before him. It puts us in a position where we realize if today was the day that we were going to see Jesus Christ face to face, we would have to ask ourselves the hard question, are we ready for that? Are we ready for that? Are we in a place where we are prepared to see him face to face. For the believer, that means self-evaluation. It means really reflecting on our lives and whether we're living in a manner that's worthy of the gospel calling that God has graciously brought us into. If we're not followers of Jesus Christ, it compels us, it compels us to consider the good news of Christ and the forgiveness of sins that he offers because the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, either leading to everlasting life or as we read this morning, leading to everlasting condemnation. I think that having this anticipation of the coming of Christ is especially important because we need to live with wisdom in these particular days because they're times of unparalleled deception. We need to live with wisdom in these particular days because they are times of unparalleled deception. You know this, that society has been impacted by the proliferation of fake news, right? And, and society is being manipulated by algorithms and agendas. There is a dependency that we have on technology to be the source of truth. And that technology, of course, is being run by corporate entities that subsidize them, that have an agenda. Like one thing for sure is this, the rise of social media as a news source has proven that the masses can be easily manipulated. I wanna just give you a piece of wisdom, a piece of advice as you are charting the course for 2024, just because someone shares it on their social media doesn't mean it's true, right? And the statistics is interesting, you know, 35% of evangelical Christians said over the course of the last couple of years that they shared things that weren't true that other people shared with them. Interestingly enough, 35% is 10% higher than the national average. You would think that as followers of Christ, we would be more discerning we would have a greater capacity to sort through what is true and what isn't true, and yet sometimes we ourselves fall prey to things that are false. We live in a post-truth society. And that phrase post-truth was Oxford Dictionary's word of the year in 2016, probably should have been phrase of the year. But in 2016, you know this was when that phrase really became prolific, the phrase fake news. Um, and because of that, it just brought about the realization that as a society, we really are in a post-truth condition. 
Oxford Dictionary went on to say that that phrase, post-truth, relates to circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than emotional appeals. I just want to read that again because I think that it's important. They said, circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than emotional appeals. That means that our society around us is less concerned with the facts and more more likely to rely on their emotions to determine what they believe is true or false. I think that that really is at the root of a cultural condition that I would say to you is a sickness. In other words, it should be no surprise to us that our culture has abandoned truth it should be no surprise to us that we, are, we have a greater tendency to lean into our emotions to determine what we believe is true or false than, than facts should not be a surprise because, of course, the reigning philosophy, not just in our educational systems but in our society, is that all things are relative, that there is no truth. There is no objective truth. This has been, you know, an agenda certainly underway in our culture for a number of decades. The the disbanding or the untethering of our society from objective truth. And so in I'm saying to you today like we have as as a culture, we have been primed to be disconnected from truth and and as a result to be more susceptible to deception. And we know that in the end times, there is going to be unparalleled deception. Matthew chapter 24, verse 24 says this. Jesus is talking about um, the time preceding his second advent. He says, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. And Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, he's referring specifically to this tribulation period and the, and the rise of the Antichrist. But he's talking about a global society that has been prepared to be deceived. Like this just doesn't happen overnight. Paul says this, he says, and then the lawless one will be revealed. That's the Antichrist whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. Look, I'm saying to you today, I'm just preparing your hearts, I'm giving you a warning that the, tr- the tribulation period certainly is going to be a time of unparalleled deception. There will be false signs and false wonders that will be perpetuated by the devil and by the Antichrist and by the false prophet. But the groundwork for that, listen to me today, the groundwork for that is being laid right now. Revelation chapter 12, verse four, describes what Paul was talking about in these terms. He's, John says, and they worshiped the dragon, that is the devil, for he had given his authority to the beast and they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast and who can fight against it? And so look, it's hard for us to get our minds around this, but that tribulation period is going to be a time where the devil and the antichrist will be openly, publicly worshiped. And that is, that is the culmination of years of deception that have been laid in a global sense. I'm encouraging you today, you need God's truth. You need God's truth. You need to be a student of God's word. Whether it's technology, social media, the internet, your favorite news broadcast, whatever it may be, you and I have a responsibility to be Bereans, to see things from God's perspective, to see with the end in mind, we need to be weighing all things against God's word, right? That means, that happens when we gather together. Listen, please be consistent this year in gathering together with God's people. You know, our at, at post-COVID, 
the Christian experience in our country and really across the world has radically shifted where um, it, it was like, for the most part, people would come to church every weekend, believers, strong believers, every weekend or at least three out of four weekends in a month. That has shifted across the board. Now people think that they're, they've got a really strong relationship with God if they make it to the gathering of God's people two times out of four times per month. And this is what churches are beginning to experience. And I think, man, maybe, and I'm, I'm beating a dead horse here, maybe more than ever we need to be rooted and in, locked into God's word, gathering together weekly, spending our time in daily devotional, opening up the scriptures ourselves. So it's an unparalleled time of deception. Um, in, in addition to that, uh, there is, and there's going to be even more so, a global rise of anti-Semitism. We see this all around us today. I wanna to remind you today that Israel's ex existence is a miracle. Uh, we thank God for what he is doing in the, the nation of Israel. Um, the nation of Israel is not an apartheid state. It, the, the land was given to the Jewish people. A homeland was given to them post-World War II. And this was a, a global decision for the nation of Israel. So sad today that people don't know the history. But, but please remember with me, Satan is always going to be against the people of God. We know that as we study the scriptures, Cain was against Abel, Pharaoh was against the Israelites, the Babylonians were against the Jews who were living in Judea. Of course, you have the Romans, and you have Herod, and you have pogroms, and you have the Holocaust. The devil hates those whom God loves. And God, in Deuteronomy chapter eight, he's speaking over the Jewish people at the inception of the nation. He says to them in Deuteronomy chapter eight, I didn't choose you because you were so big or such a great nation. God says to them, I chose you because I love you. And the ones whom God loves become a target of the adversary. That is true for Jews today. It is also true for Christians. You might be thinking today, why can't I get a break? You might look back on your year and you might be thinking, man, God, come on. You know, I thought... I was gonna walk with you and be obedient to you and, and lean into you and pray and, and have values that honored you and God, it just seems like the, the devil was after me all year long. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. And you know, the, the stronger, this is not a disincentive to walk strong with God, but the stronger you walk with the Lord, the more of a target you're going to become because the devil is jealous of your love for God. And, 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 the, and the devil is jealous of God's love for you. Paul said it this way, we must, through, we, we must enter the kingdom of God through many tribulations. So what's true for us is true for the Jewish people. Certainly this year, certainly you were shocked at the level of anti-Semitism. Certainly you were shocked when just 80 years after World War II and the Holocaust, you have people who are actually denying that the Holocaust ever happened. I'm saying to you today, you just need to step back and remember that Israel is the canary in the coal mine. You have to watch how the world treats Israel because how the world treats Israel will give you a spiritual temperature as to what is really happening. And there right now is an increase of global anti-Semitism. I know some of you were probably um, as disappointed as I was in the presidents of UPenn and MIT and Harvard. You know, as we saw them addressing Congress and asked if they could unequivocally condemn genocide of the Jewish people, and, 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 and they equivocated. They didn't unequivocally say that genocide for the Jewish people is in all circumstances absolutely wrong. They equivocated and they said, well, it depends upon the circumstances. And I would just say to you, like, when is genocide ever okay at any time for any people? The absurdity of that, right, but, but then the significance of these individuals who are leading the leading educational institutes, not just in the United States of America, but in the world. 
Like we're talking about MIT and Penn and Harvard. Like this is, this is the framework in which our young people are growing up. Our institutions of higher learning, and, and don't get me wrong today, I am not against institutions of higher learning um, that, are, that are secular. I, I, got, I gave my life to Christ. I was born again at UC Irvine. I know the need to have good, solid Christian witnesses in our campuses across America. But we can't be blind. We can't be ignorant to the reality of the propaganda that is being shoved down the throats of our young people. And you say, well, what's the solution to that? And I say to you, it's the family unit. It's the family unit. Like, it's, it's your family. It's your family. The, the strongest generator of culture in people is not the society around us. It is the family. And the family is where spiritual values and love for God is handed off, passed down. You can't abdicate that responsibility to a Christian school. You can't abdicate that responsibility to a youth leader. You can abdicate that responsibility to the peers that are surrounding your children. You as a parent are responsible to be the one leading and discipling your children to be followers of Jesus Christ. There is gonna be a rise in global anti-Semitism. We see it today. You just, you, you consider how the United Nations votes on things that always are anti-Israel, right? That is just the way that it seems to work from a global perspective. And this is going to compel the Jewish people to look to a leader to bring peace between them and other nations and also unite divided kingdoms. Unfortunately, that leader that they look to is going to be the Antichrist. And he is going to have a great capacity to broker peace in situations where there, where there wasn't peace. In fact, Paul says this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. He says, let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of lawlessness, that is the Antichrist, is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship. Check this out so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Now, like I said, I don't have a a ton of time to unpack this, but for that to happen, for the Antichrist to be in a place where he is able to go into the temple of God, you say, well, where is the temple of God? There is no temple of God right now. The temple was destroyed in 70 AD by Titus and three uh, legions of Roman soldiers. There's not, right now, there's the Dome of the Rock, there's the Al-Aqsa Mosque. So we know that there's going to be a temple that's rebuilt. For the temple to be rebuilt, there have to be Jews living in the land. There wasn't Jews living, I mean, in, in a, there were Jews living in the land, but there was no national Israel. The Jewish people did not have a homeland until May 14th, 1948. And for him to go into the temple, there have to be sacrifices that are being reinstituted. All I'm saying to you guys is is this, okay? And I'll just say it in like very simple terms. Wake up and smell the coffee. Like wake up. All of this is happening before your eyes. Like we are the, we are the generation that is seeing this come to pass. Three and a half years into the seven year covenant relationship with Israel, Daniel chapter nine, this is what Matthew chapter four, Jesus says it's gonna happen. The Antichrist is gonna go into the rebuilt temple where sacrifices are being offered. By the way, all of the, all of the garments of the priest, all of the tools that are used for the sacrificial process, all of that is in place. The Antichrist is gonna go in, cause all sacrifices to cease to God, and he's gonna demand that sacrifices be made to himself. And then there will be an all out persecution of the Jewish people. So that Jesus says, you know, you're gonna wish in that day that you were not giving birth. If it's on the Sabbath or whatever the case may be, you're gonna flee to the mountains for protection. I'm saying to you, we, we are seeing these things come to pass before our very eyes. The final thing today is this. 
Um, these end times, these last days, will be, t- will be a time of moral decadence as in the days of Noah. It will be a time of global moral decadence as in, and these are the words of Jesus, Matthew chapter 24, as in the days of Noah. So there will be a global rejection of God. There will be a development of secular society. There will be a persecution of God's people, and there will be a global moral decay. It will be as bad as it was in Genesis chapter six when God himself says, the spirit of the Lord will not always strive with mankind. As humanity is untethered from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the moral infrastructure that Christianity has supplied to the Western world, we are going to see, obviously, an increase of moral decadence. Paul says it like this in 2 Timothy 3 verse one. He says, understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. People will be lovers of of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless. You're like, I'm using that one, Pastor. (laughs) Use it in love. Ungrateful, unholy, heartless, I'm telling you guys, like, this is the thing. It kills me, it kills you. The stuff that we see perpetrated against people, the victimization, the exploitation, the, 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 the elderly among us, you know, so, so heartlessly abused. Heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit. Love, yeah, chew on that one, man. That's, well, that's a fascinating phrase. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. And then, and then Paul says, avoid such people. Avoid such people. Hey, this is, this is the truth. We are living today in an America that is post-Christian. It is a post-Christian society. And not only that, but we are in the generation that is seeing the end of Christendom in the West. Christendom started in the fourth century AD and it is, it is progressed. It's had its uh, cycles of strength and weakness, but virtually everyone agrees with this. As we see secular society emerge in the West, we are simultaneously seeing the end of Christendom. The moral framework that Christianity provided for the Western culture is being abandoned. I like it the way that Tim Keller said it. He said, Western culture wants the moral benefits of Christianity without Christ. That, that is it. Western culture wants the moral benefits of Christianity without Christ. And so you, you might be thinking, well, like, what's your point? Where are you going with this? I'm saying to you the moral condition, condition of our society is going to get worse. The moral condition of our society is going to grow worse. Isaiah says it this way in Isaiah 59, justice is driven back, righteousness stands at a distance, truth has stumbled in the streets, honesty cannot enter, truth is nowhere to be found, and whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. Uh, So when you are looking, watching the news, and you're seeing these events come to pass, and you see this moral decay, right? There's this turning away from from even the basic moral framework that that we've enjoyed, not perfectly enjoyed, but we've enjoyed as a society. As you see things coming to pass that you think, man, I never thought that we'd be in this place. As you consider what the scripture says, you know exactly why this is happening. And you also know that the only answer for, 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 Society and for the people in society is a spiritual awakening. That's what we need. So like Noah, like Noah who was secured in the ark by God, you are secure, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are secure in the salvation that he has provided for you. Right, when he said, it is finished, and when you chose to believe, that settled, it settled the situation for you. The Bible says that you were indwelt by the Spirit of God who is the down payment 
of your inheritance. In other words, he who began the good work in you is going to be faithful to complete it. You live today with the shalom of God. You live with the wholeness, you live with the completeness, and you live with a sense of security. And that is important because that means when the world is trying to provoke you to fear this year, and it's gonna happen, when the world is trying to provoke you to fear, you can stand strong and say, and say, fear not for I have redeemed you. God has redeemed you. God is preserving you. God is faithful to you. As followers of Christ, we operate from glory to glory, from strength to strength. That means that we're rooted in the mission of God. We're never wringing our hands. We're never filled with fear. We're, we're never wondering, God, how are you gonna get yourself out of this predicament or mess? Because we know how the story ends. We know that one day we're gonna stand before him and he will wipe away every tear. We know that one day we'll be before him and death will have been vanquished. We know that one day we'll stand before him and sickness will be gone. We know one day we'll stand before him and we'll hear him say these words, write it for it is true, I am the alpha and the omega. What he has completed in the heavenly places is as settled there as it is here. And so you and I don't live with fear. We can engage in the mission of God you say, Pastor, you painted a pretty bleak picture. No, I haven't. I, pre I painted some awesome opportunity. Awesome opportunity. People are lost. People are living under deception. People are disconnected from God. I can't think of a better time to live than now to be in influence for the gospel of Jesus Christ in every single sphere. Brothers and sisters, we're not gonna go and buy a, whole state where we can build our little compound and dig holes in the dirt and store up food and get our ammunition and guns, what we're gonna do is we're gonna live boldly in this moment and we're gonna fulfill the Great Commission. <laughs> and, and listen, this is the last thing, he's coming back. He's coming back. And, and so let me, let me just say it, in super profound, intellectual, theological terms, it's time for us to get after it, yes. right? It's time for us to get after it, man. Don't sit, don't sit, on the, don't sit in the stands. Don't, don't be looking as a spectator. Get on the field and get busy about your father's work. If he came back today, would you be ready?